Go to Istanbul today, and you'll see a bustling modern city. New buildings and highways side by side with structures from the Ottoman era, and narrow side streets paved in the same cobblestones people have walked on for centuries. The city, even today, is a gateway between the East and the West. It was always Europe's gateway to Persia, India, China, and everywhere else. That was until the Ottomans slammed shut that gateway and forced the Europeans to venture out into the sea for a route to Asia. And we're still feeling the effects of that today. But if you go below the streets of old Istanbul, you'll find that this is a city haunted by its past. Ancient ghosts, older even than the Ottoman sultans, echo the past from the ruins peaking just above the surface. Before it was Istanbul, this city was called Constantinople, and it was the capital of the last of the Romans. Then, as now, it was the gateway to the east. The empire that ruled from it was Roman, but it spoke Greek. It was European, but also Asian. With one foot in each world, Constantinople was the last uncracked gem in the Roman crown, and it kept the last flame of Roman civilization alive for a thousand years after the fall of the Western Empire, all because of this city, Constantinople. And its story begins with one man, who gave his name to the Queen of Cities, the city of the world's envy. Most people today discount the great man theory of history out of hand, and in most cases, they're right to. Most of the quote-unquote great men and women of history had dozens or even hundreds of capable individuals backing them that made their rise to power possible, or who even wrote their historical legacy themselves. But sometimes the course of history does in fact come down to the charisma, ability, and choices of one individual. The right person at the right time definitely can change the course of history. Charlemagne is one example, Genghis Khan is another, and even George Washington is yet another. Put simply, all three of those people, and many others, were in the right place at the right time. They had the means and the will to change the course of history, and without them, the world would look very different than it does today. Each one of them had fantastic lieutenants, advisors, and other talented figures behind them, but it was their personalities and leadership that held them all together and directed all that talent and energy towards a single goal. And the individual I want to talk about today is a prime example of the right man at the right time. Like nobody since the days of Caesar and Augustus had done, he fundamentally changed the Roman Empire. He was the main reason Rome became a Christian empire. The choices he made also allowed the empire to survive into the 15th century, despite the loss of Rome itself and pretty much the whole rest of the empire. His name was Constantine, and his reign resuscitated the empire pumping enough life into Rome to allow it to survive another thousand years, even without the city it was born in. This is the story of Rome's first Christian emperor. It's the story of the beginning of the split between Eastern and Western Rome, and indeed the Catholic and Orthodox churches. And it's the story of a new city that would become the envy of all the world. I'm Renegade Historian, and this is the story of Constantine the Great. We human beings are a funny bunch. Mixed up bundles of contradictions and spirit. As much angels as we are devils. And history is our story. It's the million little epic tales of which yours is a part. The actions of our ancestors echo in us. The good the bad, and the in-between. The past may be a different country, and they may do things differently there, but as a country we've all visited through the same human drama 
that has been played out millions of times over thousands of years. And if we know where we've been, then maybe we'll be able to see where we're going. This is Renegade Historian, and these are our stories. This story begins right where the last one ended, at the court of Diocletian. Constantine's time in Nicomedia was a crash course in power politics, if nothing else. Diocletian understood strength, but he did play favorites, and Constantine's plans to inherit his father's position and use it to advance his own power and position were upended, when the Caesar in the east, Galerius, convinced Diocletian to alter his plans for succession. Initially, the two Augusti, Diocletian and Maximian, were supposed to step down and allow for the peaceful ascension of their respective Caesars, Constantius and Galerius, to their former offices. Meanwhile, Constantius' son and Maximian's son were to become Caesars. Well, Galerius took over as Augustus when Diocletian and Maximian stepped down, but instead of appointing Constantine and Maxentius as the new Caesars, he instead appointed Maximinus Dea and Severus, who were Galerius' nephew and old army buddy, respectively. As you can imagine, a man as ambitious as Constantine wasn't about to take that lying down. Maximian and Maxentius weren't going to be walked all over either. So, all parties rallied their troops and Rome spiraled into yet another civil war. Constantine went to Britain to rendezvous with his father and the two spent the last year of Constantius' life campaigning north of Hadrian's Wall where Constantine earned the respect and loyalty of his men. When Constantius died in July 306, the old Caesar's men proclaimed Constantine their new Augustus, ruler over all of Western Rome. The soldiers liked hereditary rule, and Constantine had earned a name for himself during his campaigns in the east for Diocletian, not to mention their campaigns north of Hadrian's Wall. Maxentius soon followed suit and proclaimed himself to be his father's successor. Galerius didn't like that one bit, so he attempted to bring these young upstarts to heel. But two failed invasions of Italy later, and he was no closer to unseating either Constantine or Maxentius. Galerius was forced to recognize Constantine and Maxentius as rulers in their father's former territory, but as Caesars, not Augusti. Constantine chose Augusta Treverorum, modern-day Trier, Germany, as his capital, same as his father. The city had been destroyed in a Germanic raid in 275, but Constantine and his father rebuilt and beautified it, turning it into a powerhouse of the Western Empire. The man had a knack for building cities, what can I say? Traces of Constantine's city can still be seen in Trier. Actually, a part of his palace still stands there today, although it was repurposed as a church. A fitting testament to its builder's legacy, in my opinion. From Trier, Constantine ruled over all the west, except Italy and North Africa. Those fell under Maxentius' control. The young Caesar campaigned along the Rhine, honing his leadership abilities against the wild Germanic barbarians, brave or stupid enough to cross into his territory. Though Rome had already transitioned from an offensive footing to a defensive one, many emperors still crossed the Rhine to wreck house and show those filthy barbarians they were still in charge. Constantine was no different. His campaigns across the Rhine were so effective that his men gave him the epithet Germanicus Maximus IV for his four victories over the Germans. But, returning to the home front, Constantine had some politicking to do to secure his position. His wife Minervina had died, so Constantine took Maximian's daughter, Flavia Maximia Fausta, as his bride. 
In exchange, Maximian recognized Constantine's authority over his territories, and Constantine recognized Maxentius, Maximian's son, as his senior Augustus. But soon after that, Maximian made an attempt on Constantine's life. The emperor then ordered his own father-in-law to commit suicide. And if you think your family drama is bad, count yourself lucky that your father has never tried to have your husband assassinated, and in retaliation, your husband ordered your father to kill himself. It could always be worse. Anyway, the situation was destabilized even further in 312, when Galerius died of cancer. The empire was left in the command of four men, who all didn't trust one another. Not even a little bit. Licinius and Maximinus Dea were locking horns over control of the Eastern Empire, while Constantine and Maximian's son Maxentius sized one another up across the Alps. But the powder keg didn't sit idle for long. Constantine allied with Licinius against Maximinus Dea and Maxentius. Before the year was out, Constantine was ready to invade Italy with his army of veteran troops, while Maxentius strengthened his position behind the Aurelian walls that surrounded Rome, the final prize of this conflict. The West wasn't big enough for the two of them. Maxentius didn't oppose Constantine's invasion of Italy. Instead, he waited in Rome for his rival to lay siege. Initially, he ordered the Milvian Bridge to the north of the old city of Rome torn down, so he could keep Constantine at arm's length and force him into a protracted siege in enemy territory. But when Constantine arrived at Rome, Maxentius made the fateful choice to stop tearing down the bridge so he could ride out to face his enemy. Now, legend has it that on the eve of battle, Constantine received a vision. In the sky, he saw a Cairo, the initials of Christ, the voice of the god of Abraham told him, In hoc signo vinces, or, In this sign, conquer. Ever a superstitious man, Constantine ordered his men to paint the symbol on their shields. Whatever you make of the veracity of that story, Constantine did win the Battle of Milvian Bridge handily. Maxentius was completely outmatched and would have been far better served waiting Constantine out like he'd originally planned. Maxentius' men were slaughtered after he'd bravely led them across the bridge. Their commander tried to flee back into the city but fell off the bridge, knocked aside by some fleeing refugees, and drowned in the Tiber, weighed down by his own armor. In another move that makes me feel bad for Fausta, Constantine's army found Maxentius' corpse on the banks of the Tiber later and paraded his severed head through the streets of Rome on a pike. Constantine not only made no effort to stop that gruesome parade, he even sent the head to Maxentius' allies in North Africa, which quickly brought them to heel. At Milvian Bridge, the Western Empire was reunited. From Britain all the way down to Tunisia, Western Rome was once again under the rule of a single man in the Eternal City. But it's what Constantine did after his victory that makes this different from any other civil war in Roman history. Because, after taking the capital, Constantine made it clear he was a friend of the Christians, and what's more, that he was a Christian himself. For a long time, Constantine had been soft on the Christians, neither he nor his father ever enforced Diocletian's anti-Christian policies. But in 312, he became the first openly Christian emperor of any part of the Roman Empire. Many like to posit that Constantine's conversion was a cynical power play, seizing on political power the Christians had amassed. But that's just not the case, because converting to Christianity was not a smart move politically in the early 4th century. The Christians were still very much a religious minority, localized to major urban centers, mostly in the eastern reaches of the empire. They were still either ignored or flat-out despised by Roman society. But Constantine alone would advance the cause of the young church from the very beginning of his reign over the West. At just shy of 40 years old, Constantine had never been to Rome before. 
but he was never one to stand on ceremony or be awestruck by something so simple as another city. He already had plans for it. It only took Constantine two months to get the pagan elite of the city to fall in line, and in those two months he took over some of the existing building projects that Maxentius had started. And for as great a general as he was, the most tangible remnants of Constantine's reign are the things that he built. The main project that was started by Maxentius was a colossal basilica. Now, basilica is a word we associate with churches today, but initially it just referred to a sort of public forum with meeting spaces, shops, and some even had administrative uses as well. But Constantine made a statement with this basilica. He put a huge cross on display in it, which irritated more conservative elements in Roman society. But while that was a bold move, Constantine's other Christian building projects were kept to the outer reaches of the city. He built a number of churches on the outskirts of Rome, the largest of which, St. John in the Lateran, is still there today, albeit heavily altered during the medieval era and renaissance. These churches were some of the first to be public buildings. For the first few centuries of Christian history, mass and other meetings were held in the homes of the congregation. But Constantine's grand public buildings would be Christian hubs for entire cities, the precursors to modern churches. In a further break from tradition, Constantine disbanded the Praetorian Guard. The organization that had protected and sometimes assassinated emperors since the days of Augustus. But they'd outlived their usefulness and, not to mention, had taken serious losses at Milvian Bridge. The last of the Praetorians were sent packing, and Constantine replaced them with a new elite cavalry unit referred to as the Candidati. He also disbanded all of Maxentius's other elite units. Oh, and St. John in the Lateran? Constantine built that over the old headquarters of Maxentius' elite cavalry. The man knew how to send a message. A new era was at hand for the Roman Empire, and it was further reinforced by the mansion Constantine presented to Pope Militatis. The building would be the home of his successors for centuries to come. The mansion no longer stands, but the Vatican that replaced it is the home of the Pope today, and has been for several centuries. In addition to that, Constantine built a number of smaller shrines and churches along the outskirts of Rome, including the Church of Old St. Peter's, built on the traditional site of St. Peter's tomb, west of the Tiber River. The saint's tomb and the foundations of that old church can still be seen today in the papal catacombs beneath St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. Finally, Constantine built his own triumphal arch, still visible today near the Colosseum. Anyone visiting that great arena or the nearby ruins of the Forum can't miss it. The arch shows Constantine was looking to move on from Rome when it was built. It actually reused parts of older works in its construction to speed things up a bit. And it's true. Constantine was finished with his conquests in the West and now sought to reunite Rome by conquering its wealthy eastern provinces, but he had a major roadblock in his way, his former ally Licinius, emperor in the east. So, in 313, he held talks with his eastern counterpart in Mediolanum, modern-day Milan, and the two agreed to share rule over the empire, Constantine in the west and Licinius in the east. To seal the deal, Constantine gave his half-sister Flavia Julia Constantia to Licinius in marriage. Constantine also got his counterpart to end his persecution of Christians with the Edict of Milan, which was neither an edict nor was it from Milan. Licinius actually issued it from his capital a bit later, but it did legalize Christianity across the empire, except for Maximinus Dea's territory where he continued Diocletian's policies, though not for long. Licinius defeated Dea in a war, and then extended the edict to the whole of the Eastern Empire. Christianity was now legal across Roman territory, and Rome's emperor count had dwindled to two. 
But half an empire wasn't enough for a man like Constantine. The diplomatic relationship between Constantine and Licinius deteriorated quickly. And from 316 to 324, Rome descended into yet another series of civil wars. Constantine had to deal with a long frontier territory that was constantly being probed by barbarians in addition to his war with Licinius, but he still got the better of his rival throughout the war. Constantine won a major victory over his rival at Hadrianopolis, and his son Crispus followed up with a major naval victory at the Hellespont. Backed into a corner, Licinius took up position in Chrysopolis, a town in what is today Asian Istanbul. Above one camp, pagan banners. Above the other, a sea of Kairos and Christian imagery. Given how I've been talking about him this episode, I shouldn't need to tell you that Constantine won. He was now the sole emperor of Rome. For the first time in decades, there was just one emperor. But aside from that, this was far from a return to tradition. Constantine had plans. After his victory, when he had no rival emperors to oppose him, Constantine began openly behaving like a Christian. In 326, he visited Rome to celebrate 20 years on the throne, and to the shock of many, he refused to participate in the customary sacrifice to Jupiter. The importance of the old pagan religion was beginning to wane, and Constantine believed he was on a mission from God to Christianize the empire. See, Constantine's influence is still felt today in almost every Christian church, from a Catholic basilica in France to a Baptist church in America or an Orthodox monastery in Greece. He was the main reason Rome became a Christian empire and why the church became so powerful when the Western Empire collapsed. It was the last major institution of Rome left standing in Western Europe in 476. Constantine started that mission by diverting the traditional subsidies given to pagan temples to the Christian church. He mandated religious toleration, and while he did allow pagan temples to stand both east and west as part of that toleration policy, he did confiscate their wealth and ban some sacrifices to the old gods. The money he extracted from the pagans was directed to both build new churches and support the poor. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Roman emperors helping the poor. The earlier Roman system of patronage encouraged local nobility to do just that in their own towns and cities. But Constantine aided the poor on an entirely new scale, giving more support to more people than ever which many pagans thought was a waste, but Christians strongly supported. And that wasn't all. Christian bishops now took on new privileges like the pagan priests of days gone by, and even a few those priests never enjoyed. For example, bishops were given a right to trial by their peers. They were also freed from many of the obligations the Roman rich owed to their local governments. Constantine's new laws extended to everyday Christians as well. The punishments for celibacy that had existed since the days of Augustus were eliminated. Christians thought celibacy was a good thing, one of the many reasons the pagans didn't like these oddball cultists to begin with. Divorce was also made more difficult, and the practice of crucifixion was done away with. Finally, Early Christians had debated for centuries whether they ought to hold the Sabbath on Saturday, like the Jews, or on the day they believed Jesus rose from the dead, Sunday. Constantine ended that debate definitively by declaring Sunday as a day of rest for all urban activities. This still hangs around in a few places. For example, in many towns in rural France, even today, everything is closed down on Sunday. Generally, only the baker's shops are allowed to be open as they used to be exempted under the later medieval laws forcing everything to close on Sundays. Those laws largely don't exist anymore, but the tradition still does. 
And that brings me to a matter of some debate, if the comments on my last episode were any indication at least. And that is Constantine's personal beliefs. Was he actually a Christian, or was this just a cynical power grab? I'm inclined to believe he was sincere. Remember, the pagan religion of Rome was still very powerful in the early 4th century. It was Constantine's actions that weakened it considerably. When Constantine converted, which, based on what I've read, was shortly after his victory at Milvian Bridge, Christians were still a minority. A growing and large minority, but a minority nonetheless. Particularly in the West. The East was where most of Rome's Christian population could be found. The Christians were also largely urban. The religion did not catch on in the rural parts of the empire. In fact, the term pagan was derived from the Latin paganus, meaning rustic. It was actually a derogatory term used for the non-Christians when Christianity became Rome's dominant religion. But even after they became a majority, Christians were largely concentrated in cities, which represented a minority of the Roman population. The majority of people did not live in cities until very recently. It wasn't politically expedient for Constantine to convert in the early 4th century, and it may have actually harmed his political career had he not been as skilled a politician as he was. See, he was rather ambiguous in his conversion. Publicly, he still appeared to be a devotee of Sol Invictus. Or at least he gave himself enough wiggle room and plausible deniability. For a while, he even seemed to practice a sort of syncretism with both Christianity and the cult of Sol Invictus. He commissioned a lot of art wherein whether the subject was Sol Invictus or Jesus Christ depended largely on who was looking at it. I think Constantine's conversion was genuine. He was just a politician. Many often cite his late baptism as proof of an insincere conversion, but that's not the case. At the time, a lot of the doctrine we now take for granted wasn't so concrete. So many Christians who converted later in life would put off their baptism to lessen the chances of sinning afterwards and thus increase their odds of getting into heaven. Let's not forget that Constantine had killed a lot of people in his climb to the top. For a pagan emperor, that likely didn't matter as much. The gods could forgive a lot being done in the name of glory. But for a man who, in all likelihood, believed he was on a mission from God, I'm willing to bet those murders weighed on his conscience. So, he saved his baptism for the end of his life to be purged of his sins and reduce his odds of doing something between baptism and death to jeopardize his salvation. So, was Constantine truly a Christian? Well, only he knew for certain but I also don't think it was some sort of cynical attempt to garner support from the Christians. Further, what could the Christians have actually offered Constantine in exchange for his support? Most of them were poor or working class, many were slaves or women. What military, economic, or political support would they have been able to give him? What's more, the Christians at this stage weren't all that interested in state power, and Constantine had already given them what they wanted. Constantine had always tolerated Christians in the parts of the empire that he controlled. To argue that Constantine had anything of substance to gain from the Christians in the early 4th century is to read the later temporal power of the church into the past. The medieval church you're thinking of when you do that is a far cry from the actual church of the 4th century. Becoming a Christian himself openly, no less, shows to me that Constantine likely did truly believe in Jesus. That said, the emperor's Christianity would not stop him from executing his son Crispus and wife Fausta in 326. Allegedly, the two of them were in a relationship, but the sources alleging that came much later, well after all parties were dead. Now, 
executing your own wife and son is not a particularly Christian thing to do, but I don't think it speaks to his conversion being insincere. Rather, it speaks to the fact that Constantine was not somebody you wanted to be on the bad side of. The emperor's personal life aside, Jesus' famous render unto Caesar line took on new meaning when Caesar was a fellow Christian. The Christians had never known official support like this. While Constantine still took the title of Pontifex Maximus, a title given to the chief priest of the old pagan religion, and while he still publicly at least worshipped Sol Invictus and the old gods, he legitimized Christianity in a way no previous emperor, however tolerant they may have been, had done before. There is evidence of Constantine practicing syncretism, worshipping both Sol Invictus and the god of Abraham at the same time for a while. That was nothing new. Severus Alexander may have been doing that. But Constantine got more Christian and less pagan as he got older. In supporting the Christians publicly, Constantine had become the de facto temporal leader of Christianity, as he had more influence on the lives of Christians than even the Pope, because not every Christian listened to the Pope. The early Christian church had splintered into various local churches with different beliefs and even versions of the Bible. This wouldn't stand. If Christianity was to be the religion of the new Roman Empire, then just as there was one empire, one emperor, and one god above, so too would there be one church. So, in 325, Constantine called together a gathering of important bishops from across the Christian world at Nicaea, modern-day Iznik, Turkey. And the Council of Nicaea is another choice of Constantine's that we are still feeling today. The main reason for Nicaea was a debate raging in the Christian world over the very nature of Jesus. Then, as now, most Christians believe that Jesus was both fully man and fully God, an idea that isn't logical at all and which can only really be reconciled by faith. Christians still refer to that and a handful of other ideas as mysteries. But there were other interpretations of the nature of Jesus. One of the fastest growing and most dangerous form of Christianity was Arianism. And no, it has nothing to do with A.Y. Arians, a shortened form of the name Indo-Aryans and or Indo-Europeans, an ancient people group who were very distant precursors to several modern people groups in Europe, the Middle East, and India. They had nothing to do with Christians, and the A.Y. Aryan has unfortunately taken on considerably more Hitlery connotations. No, I'm talking about the A.R. Aryans, named for an Egyptian bishop called Arius, who put forth the idea that God the Father created Jesus, not as his equal, but as a human, albeit one who was way better than the rest of us. The Arian debate threatened the very core of Christianity and had the potential to split the church within the empire. So, Constantine called prominent bishops together in the first ecumenical, in Greek, world, council. Among the prominent Christians at the council were Arius himself, Eusebius of Caesarea, who is one of the main sources we have on the life of Constantine, and Saint Nicholas. Yes, that Saint Nicholas, the 4th century Greek, who became very popular in Northern Europe, the Germanic countries in particular, and over the centuries, transformed into the jolly, fat, gift-giving fellow we know today as Santa Claus or Father Christmas. Side note, OG St. Nicholas was kind of a badass. It's known that at one point in the council, he took such exception to what Arius was saying that he straight up decked the guy. You're lucky if all you get for being naughty is a lump of coal, because Santa has a mean right hook, kids. Anyway, despite lobbying from many prominent Romans and Christian thinkers, Arianism was defeated at Nicaea. Formally, at least. The council agreed on the Nicene Creed, which you can still hear being said in Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches the world over every Sunday. 
that confession of the faith would become the new imperial religion in time. That said, Arianism was a resilient idea, and it didn't die at Nicaea. There had never been a strong, centralized force behind Christianity enforcing correct beliefs or orthodoxy before. That means heretics now had more to worry about than a scathing philosophical takedown. They now had state power to fear. Regardless, Arius kept preaching his now heretical beliefs. They didn't gain a whole lot of traction within the Roman Empire where Nicene Christianity was the state-endorsed form of the religion. But Arius' ideas did gain considerable traction among the Germanic barbarians north of the Danube. Indeed, some of the tribes that would invade Rome in the coming centuries would be Arian Christians. It didn't displace their native Germanic paganism in the way that Nicene Christianity was well on its way to displacing the Roman religion, but it was a popular and growing religion come the 5th century. And Constantine's Christianization of Rome didn't stop there. The longer his reign, the more Christian he got. In 327, Constantine sent his mother Helena on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. She was to locate and mark all the important sites in Jesus' life, like Bethlehem and the Mount of Olives. She had access to a blank check to build churches on those sites and improve existing ones. Constantine later joined his mother in Jerusalem and ordered the construction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which you can still see today, at least in part, although it's mostly a medieval church. And he didn't stop there in his rebuilding of Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem had been completely destroyed by the Romans centuries before as punishment for the Jewish revolt. Hadrian rebuilt it as Aelia Capitolina, a pagan city. Now, Constantine rebuilt Jerusalem as a Christian city. It was at the center of what he now called the Holy Land. The southern Levant had been a bit of a backwater prior to this. It was important in maintaining land-bound routes between Anatolia, Syria, and Egypt, and that was about it. But now it became a site for pilgrims from across the empire, and the city would remain a draw for pilgrimage all through the early Byzantine era, the period of Islamic rule, and beyond into the modern day. And Jerusalem wasn't the only key city that Constantine built up as a center of what would become the new Roman religion. The empire needed an eastern center of power, a new Rome, closer to the empire's main foreign enemy, Persia. And Constantine found his new Rome in the small Greek town of Byzantium on the Bosporus. The city of Constantinople was founded on May 11th, 330, and it quickly became one of the grandest cities in the empire. Constantine spared no expense. He built a new palace, as well as the Hippodrome, a circus or horse racing arena. He also built a new forum, a new senate building, and loads of new churches. At the heart of the forum, he built a column with a large nude statue of himself looking over his new capital. And to decorate said new capital, Constantine stripped bare many pagan temples throughout the empire. Now, most histories of Rome will touch on the importance of this move, but I think Constantinople was even more important than that. Constantinople was a fresh start for Rome, and it could be argued that the history of the Eastern Roman Empire begins in 330 with the establishment of that city. Constantinople quickly came to overshadow Rome. While the Eternal City had been larger in its heyday than Constantinople at its peak, roughly one million people within its walls to Constantinople's 500,000, Constantinople commanded far more wealth and power than Rome itself come the late empire. As long as the walls protecting the city from the one direction it could actually be attacked on its peninsula, the Roman Empire would live on. And that was proven true because as long as Constantine's and later Theodosius's walls stood, 
from 330 to 1453, the Roman Empire would persevere despite the odds. That was the sort of power contained within this city. It is, without a doubt, the most strategically important city in the Old World, controlling the main overland route between Europe and Asia, along with many of the prime sea routes in the eastern Mediterranean, and sole control over the whole of the Black Sea. With a new capital for his new empire, Constantine set about reorganizing the government. Now, there hadn't been an effective Roman government since the early 3rd century. The best they'd gotten was the Tetrarchy, which, of course, ended in complete chaos. So, Constantine had his work cut out for him when he set about building a new Rome, starting with the army. His first move was formally splitting civilian and military government so he wouldn't have to worry about appointing the senatorial elite to army positions. In addition, Constantine brought non-Roman officers into the army. The military was still majority Roman, but there were now considerable numbers of Armenians, Moors, and a whole lot of Germans serving in the new Roman army. While this move would later prove disastrous, for now it gave Constantine a ready supply of manpower. But these men were effectively mercenaries. They fought for Rome because it paid well, not out of any sense of duty or patriotism. Hiring people who fight for the highest bidder is all well and good as long as you are the highest bidder. But let's not worry about that right now. Constantine still had many more changes to make. For instance, he continued and formalized a trend that had been developing for several centuries. He increased the division between the core of the army and the border troops. The Roman Empire wasn't sending armies out to conquer anymore, so it needed an army more set up for defense than offense. The change had been happening organically, but Constantine set the army up for the final era in West Roman history. They were divided into two groups. First were the border guards, the Limitenni. They were small, mobile units meant to deter smaller raids and attacks. The second group were the Comitatenses, a more professional, better paid, and better equipped field army under the direct control of the Emperor that would come to sort out bigger problems like a large barbarian group breaking through the Limitenni. The Comitatenses were also the offensive arm of the Roman army. When an Emperor led an invasion, he called on the Comitatenses. The Limitenni occupied border forts along the Rhine-Danube frontier in particular. They were of decent quality and were capable of repelling small incursions, but they were also purely defensive. If anything larger than a small raid hit them, the Limitenni were to fall back to even bigger forts a few miles back from the border. From there, they were meant to stall the barbarian army for the weeks or sometimes months it took for a Comitatensis field army to respond to the incursion. Now, this may sound like modern defense in-depth tactics used by the Russians against the Germans in World War II, for example. Falling back and drawing the enemy into your own territory can certainly work when you have the size to make it work. and. Rome certainly had size in spades, but that isn't what the Romans were doing. They were too offensively minded to even think of giving territory to the enemy to buy time, and they had no more forts further back from the border to fall back to. While the legion had become more defensive, the Romans still thought the best defense was an overwhelming offense. Some things never change, I suppose. The military reforms made by Constantine set the direction of the Roman army from the early 4th century to the collapse of Western Rome in the late 5th century. But the army wasn't the only problem Constantine needed to fix. Despite the new stabilization of the empire, the economy was still in utter shambles. People didn't trust the currency issued by the government, and they had no reason to. The silver coins the economy relied upon had become heavily debased, and the government overvalued them in spite of that. But people aren't as stupid as the government likes to think they are, so the people weren't buying it, literally. 
In an effort to fix the situation, Constantine stopped the minting of the pure silver Argentus around 305. The silver coins would stick around until the middle of the century, but Constantine considered the coin too broken to actually try to fix. Instead, Constantine used a lot of the precious metals he'd gotten from stripping pagan temples to mint large quantities of the gold solidus, which retained its purity and value. Throughout the rest of late Roman history, 72 of those coins made a whole pound of gold. For the everyday Roman, though, a solidus was not something they'd just be carrying around. The average Roman would probably never have even seen one, and let alone held one, so the silver piece was replaced by various bronze coins, which continued to be debased and devalued. At the end of the day, this just resulted in the rich getting richer as the pure gold coins they were using held their value. But the bronze coins the poor and middle classes needed to rely on were constantly devalued and continued to lose their purchasing power. At this point though, the Roman economy, at least in the Western Empire, was completely and irrevocably broken. If you'll remember the previous episodes where I discussed the feudalization of Western Rome, well, the Roman economy relied on three major things in the good old days. The first was small local landholders. The concentration of so much wealth and land in the hands of so few ensured there was little anyone could actually do to fix the problem. Second was the influx of gold, slaves, and other riches from conquest. The Roman army hadn't gone out on a glorious conquest in quite a while. It had shifted to a defensive footing and wasn't really capable of the conquests of ages past. Third, there was trade. Rome controlled the whole of the Mediterranean and many of the great cities of the east, like Antioch and Alexandria. And now Constantinople, which would end up eclipsing them all. Earlier in Roman history, the power of the city of Rome ensured that trade and wealth would make its way west. But as Rome's power waned, less of that wealth made its way to Italy and beyond. It stayed in the east, which would gradually become the vastly more powerful of the two halves of the empire. These were trends that no one man could fix, if they could be fixed at all. And that brings me to the greatest tragedy of Constantine's reign. He was a once-in-a-generation leader. His vision and skill pumped enough life into the Roman Empire to keep it going for another century and a half. He took hold of an empire in the doldrums and ensured its survival into the next era. But even he could only delay the inevitable. All he could do was staunch the bleeding on an empire that had already been mortally wounded and was on a rapid decline. But you wouldn't have known that, watching the end of Constantine's reign. He spent his golden years planning new campaigns to reclaim the province of Dacia and in true Roman fashion, attack Persia. The emperor did campaign with the Sarmatians to fight the Goths in the mid-330s to restore Dacia, but the province was never brought back under Roman control. However, he did force a number of the peoples living north of the Danube into client state status. They acted as a buffer to absorb raids from tribes further north. In time, Client states like that would become federati nations, settled within Roman territory, but for now, the relationship was beneficial to Rome. The Persia campaign, on the other hand, never really came to fruition. Constantine started the campaign calling bishops to accompany his army, but it was soon called off because in early 337 he fell seriously ill and he knew the end was near. He had built a tomb for himself in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which would become the final resting place for most of the emperors of Eastern Rome until 1453. As he fell even further into illness, he summoned his bishops and told them that he wanted to be baptized in the Jordan River. But he knew that was unlikely, given that he was bedridden. Still, he was formally baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia, the bishop of the very city he was dying in. He died shortly thereafter on the last day of Pentecost, right after Easter on May 22, 337. 
The emperor was buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles. The first of many emperors laid to rest there in the next thousand years of Eastern Roman history. He left behind a Roman Empire unrecognizable to Augustus and likely even Aurelian, but it was an empire better suited to face a changing world, and it was an empire that would ultimately survive until 1453. Constantine ensured that at least Eastern Rome would survive, and the glorious queen of cities Constantinople would continue on, even as the West rapidly declined following his death. He was succeeded by Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constans in a sort of continuation of the Tetrarchy, but with a hereditary spin. That situation was not long for this world, but that's a story for next time. Until then, I'm Renegade Historian. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and have a wonderful day, everyone.